Welcome to Jason Live. We are back with our STEM career series where we learn all about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models in those fields. And I'm Melissa in for Haley today, and I'm excited to connect you with our STEM role model, Marcos Sastre Cordova. Now, Marcos is an ocean engineer at Raytheon where he develops and analyzes undersea sensor systems, all in an effort to protect the lives of soldiers deployed at sea. Now we're gonna learn all about Marcos and more in just a minute, but I wanted to remind you that today's event is live and interactive. So if you're joining us from the Jason website, below this video, you should see a box where you enter your name and your question for Marcos, or you can tweet us at hashtag Jason Live. We're gonna to try to get to as many questions as we can in the time we have. So without further ado, let's uh, get Marcos. Marcos, welcome. Welcome, Melissa. How are you doing? Thank you for Thank having me. Yes, thanks for being here. So um, just a quick question to get us started off. You work for uh, Raytheon, which is a company, but um, give us a little bit more information about what Raytheon does. So Raytheon is a big defense contractor, defense contractor, what we call it. Uh, it provides uh, military systems for um, the customer here in the United States and all around the world to our partner, to our NATO partners. And we're really a technology company. So a company that's devoted to develop technologies for cyber, space, aerospace, and undersea, and, um, and everything in between. Nice. So the d defense systems, the technology defense systems. defense systems. Okay. So um, we're just going to launch straight into questions. We've got a question here. Elliot from HMM asks, what do engineers do? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. So essentially, engineers are involved in understanding what the end use or the customer needs are and translating that, that need into a product that can satisfy those needs. And at Raytheon and for the defense systems and uh, uh, our military customer, uh, we just tend to, li we just listen to what, what, what their problems are and try to find solutions to their problems and uh, with the technology that we have developed and engineer a product that meets those, those, uh, those needs and, and solve those problems for them. Nice. So a problem solver, a professional problem solver. Uh, yeah, that will, I would like to think so. <laughs> so we've got a double question here from Olivia and then an, uh, Elliot as well. They basically ask, what kind of tools do you make and what type of sensors do you make and what are they used for? Excellent question. Um, and overall, as a, uh, in my business area, the primary sensors we build are acoustic sensors, sensors that are used to sense sound underwater. Uh, and we put those sensors in what we call sonar systems. Sonar systems are, are uh, meant to detect objects like submarines or, or mines or objects underwater, classify them and, and, uh, and avoid them in some cases or hunt them in some cases. So uh, and that's in my particular area. But Raytheon is involved develop, um, developing sensors from electro-optical domain, um, from infrared cameras to uh, very high fidelity video sensors to uh, sensors that are not sensing actually a physical stimulus for a, uh, or more of a cyber threat. So in that sense, also we develop technologies that are able to detect threats um, in this in cyberspace. So it's not oh, wow. a sensing per se with a physical sensor, but it's sensing a threat, which is something that we're very interested in. Yeah, all in that defense arena. Very cool. Um, question from Jade: uh, What does the field work you do look like, and why is your work important? Well, as my, the field uh, looks, it could look like an office space, but sometimes it looks like, a, uh, like an open space. I work in, with sensors that they are tested in the field, and our field is, is the marine environment, the undersea environment. So in some of the pictures that you might see uh, on display now, it shows uh, you know, a team of engineers uh, getting ready to test uh, uh, an autonomous underwater yeah. system. And uh, so we get to go out in the field, uh, and that's, that is the field for us, is, is, is go on boats and go, go on the water. Um, and, uh, and, but most of the time I work in an office, so it's, uh, that's, a, that's not your standard day in the office, but uh, it, it beats a day in the office. It's a field trip, right. Um, so uh, another question um, from two different people. We've got Michaela and Rohan. Um, what is your everyday routine, and what would a day in your job look like? That's interesting. Uh, so, yeah, it could be a routine, but typically I get into work uh, between 7 and 8 o'clock. Uh, 
you know, do their rounds, log into my computer and check email. Email is a very important thing, very, very important communication tool these days. And pretty much check what the fire drills are for the day. By fire drills, I mean important things that have to take, be taken care of right away. Um, and then off I go to the labs and check on the status of different jobs that I might have been running in parallel. For example, um, we have we always work in a team environment. So we have mechanical engineers, we have electrical engineers, and we have the software engineers working. So part of my job is to keep make sure that we keep those tasks uh, on track. And if there's any issues, we can talk ab you know, about them as a team and resolve the issues in a timely fashion. Um, and then sometimes I go in the lab, I get data, bring it back to my office, analyze it to see, to make sense of it um, and uh, I figure out if some, there's something wrong. And sometimes, I'm, actually, most of the time I give feedback back to the team. Hey, I think this is what's going on. Let's try to uh, fix this problem this way. Um, and, uh, that, and then at the end of the day, just I typically end about five or six o'clock. Uh, we do have a flexible uh, work schedule, so I get to work sometimes a little bit more hours than, than average, but I get to take that time off at a later date, which is pretty cool. Yeah, nice. Um, <clears throat> question just came in where you kind of touched upon this in your last answer. Do you work with anyone, and what fields do you work with? What are your coworkers' fields? Oh, you said, fantastic. You said a couple more engineers in there, yeah. right? Absolutely. So um, in my line of work, it's mostly an engineering company, but we have a huge infrastructure of other support disciplines that if, if they were not there, our, we could not do business. Uh, for example, finance, contracts, we have to keep the lawyers happy, of course, uh, and program management and program management folks come from different disciplines, some of them from business administration, but some of them come from engineering as well. So they really understand engineering problems, technical problems. And uh, so those are the type of people I work with and report to. Uh, my teammates, uh, we, we come from different walks of life. I have a, I'm a physics major by trade, and I did science and oceanography when I was doing early graduate work. And eventually, I transitioned to engineering because I wanted to play with all the toys that oceanographers use. But some of my teammates are from mechanical engineering. They, 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 they nuts and bolts and screws. That's their life. Uh, software engineers, they specialize on generating good software code and implementing it uh, bug free and something that would be highly reliable. Electrical designers, technicians, technicians are very important uh, team members in our line of work. Uh, they bridge the gap between theory and practice. Sometimes engineers will come up with a solution that there's just no way in practice it could be implementable and the technicians allow us to get to the to that solution. Uh, as well, so it's a, it's a wide variety of uh, of disciplines, including recently been play, uh, we, we've been working with a lot of applied mathematicians, and they are also working in, in, in engineering. So uh, very very interdisciplinary um, yes. uh, environment. Yeah, it it sounds like there's a lot of smart people working at Raytheon. <laughs> um, of all different kinds. Yeah. Yes. Right. So uh, we've got a question. It says Riley from JCD STEM asks. Do you go underwater? If you do, what type of diving suits do you wear? And do you get air from a tank uh, or from back on the boat? You know, I, I, uh, I, I'm a diver. I'm a dive master. I, uh, 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 but I do it recreationally. I don't do it for work. I had to do it for work one time uh, to recover some equipment that I lost. Um, but I recovered it. So it didn't get, it was not permanently lost. It was temporarily lost. But what kind of equipment I use uh, for diving? Um, I, I usually drive with a dive with a wetsuit, uh, seven mil, uh, seven millimeter uh, wetsuit. I have, do, I have uh, done diving with dry suits that keep you uh, also dry and warm, even at colder temperatures, temperatures under 40 degrees. Uh, I don't, it's not my preference. I like to stay, you know, in a, in a wetsuit and dive the season I could go in water probably between 60 and 50. 50 is the lowest temperature I would go diving into. I, oh. di I dive with compressed air. I don't use um, mixtures. Uh, I'm not a, uh, there's a group of folks that do it recreationally that dive with mixed gases, different types of gases and, and to prolong their, down, their, their, um, their downtime so they can stay underwater longer. So uh, what they do is they replace nitrogen in the air, which is typically, uh, it gets up absorb in your tissues and cause all kinds of problems with other uh, inner gases um, that uh, allows you to stay there longer. I'm not, that's called technical diving. I don't do technical diving. Um, and, uh, um, and most importantly, I need to wear a mask with that, with that prescription if, uh, if I'm to enjoy my, uh, my dive because I, I am blind as a bat if I take my glasses. <laughs> so you do recreational diving. That sounds like That's a correct. Class. Yes. So um, a comment from Ms. DeMeo's second grade class, 
and Nagatuck, uh, do you uh, actually make the sensors or do you design and then others produce them? That's right. I typically are, in, is, are, am personally involved in designing um, the parameters that govern what the sensor has to do. I work jointly with mechanical and acoustic transducer engineers that actually translate what I want to get done uh, with a particular transducer receiver into a physical implementation. And then uh, we have a group of folks here that actually fabricate the transducer and the sensor. Um, and then after that fabrication is done, I typically work with the team to integrate it all together and make it work as a system. Nice. So you have an idea of something that you want to collect, and then you're working with others to make that idea actually happen. Is that's that co that's okay. correct? And for yeah. example, in the in the case of sonar transducers and, and acoustic elements, typically you have to parameterize a problem into okay, how sensitive you want the sensor to be, how far out you need to detect a target, and then that that determines what kind of. Um, uh, properties you wanted that transducer, how much power you need to operate it, how much power you need to drive it. And then you work jointly with the electrical and the transducer guys and, and make uh, to design that sensor. Nice. Um, we've got a question here um, from JCD Stem. I'm going to piggyback on this. Uh, what type of data do you collect? And then I wanted to ask a question. When you're, when you're talking about acoustics, what is it that you're listening for underwater? Uh, uh, so very good question. So what, uh, to answer the first question first, and I'll, I'll end up with the, uh, with the acoustic question. So what kind of data we collect uh, from anything from environmental to, to just sounds underwater? Environmental data includes uh, salinity, for example, and temperature, depth. Uh, why I care about that for acoustics? Because with those parameters that I measure on the water, I can calculate the sound speed. And sound speed is very important for sound propagation. It determines how sound travels in the water column. And sound speed is not constant in the water column. It varies as a function of depth. So you get, you can get, um, you know, your, the performance of your system is affected by that profile. So, and what kind of sounds uh, do I listen for? Uh, in particular, we're listening for echoes on objects that we put out there. Uh, in my line of work, right now I'm working on mine warfare, and uh, we typically use uh, sonar to locate objects in the water and, and particularly locate mines too. So we can know where they are, we can clear them, so we make it, it, make it safe for, for the fleet to, to go by. Um, so from a sonar perspective, I'm looking at the echoes of that object and determining through signal processing if it's the real target, if it's not a target, is it something worth pursuing or not? Uh, and um, when I was working uh, with anti-submarine warfare, listening for, uh, for enemy subs, what you do is you put an array of hydrophones underwater and you listen passively, meaning you don't transmit sounds into the water. You just listen to what the environment is and you're looking for particular uh, frequencies or particular tones. Um, it's like searching for somebody by knowing her or his voice, and you're looking for that particular signature in the in the sound, and classifying that as a, oh no, that's just a whale. No, wait, that's a tanker, or no, that's a Nakula submarine, and which is you know it's, it's something to be concerned about. So those type of things are the things that I listen for. Oh wow. Okay, so we've got um, four questions here. So bear with me. <clears throat> what is the hardest problem you've had to solve? The most difficult and challenging setback that you've ever faced? Um, ep and any epic fail that you've had in your career, and how do you overcome oh, wow. those? Wow, well, epic hard fail. Here, but good wow, one. Wow, yeah. So, well, I'll, I'll answer. Uh, let me see which one I'll do first. Um, well, I think so far the toughest challenge I had to overcome happened just a few months ago where um, I was essentially I was a victim, quote unquote, of attrition, meaning a very well renowned uh, engineer in our company um, uh, had just retired and uh, they didn't have a, a direct replacement for him. So uh, his whatever his responsibilities were landed on my lap. And uh, other than a farewell and one day overlap on the task, I was pretty much OK, um, you have to figure this one out. Um, and I, had, I still do a lot of respect for, for He was a role model to me, and he still is. And one of those uh, engineers that had a lot of experience and you look up to for advice. But uh, the challenge of taking his work and how he left it behind, not that he did a poor job leaving it behind, just there was a lot to catch up with, was extremely challenging and stressful. Uh, and then just recently, we finally put the system together and made it work. So it was like a big woo for me. 
So um, that was that's a very recent, but that I think uh, in my career, 17 years I've been working, that was probably the hardest uh, um, task I had to uh, uh, overcome. Uh, it was that challenge of taking over somebody else's work, particularly somebody that had a lot of more experience than I did, mm. than, I, than I do at the time. Um, fails, um, epic fails, like, like uh, we call them. You know, um, it, nothing that big that I would say that it was an epic fail, but you know, in the routine environment, at work, you do get a, a few moments where you said you walk back from the situation and you go like, oh, man, I wish I never said that. Oh, man, I wish I approached this differently. I had a lot. I had uh, in my career, I had a lot of those, a lot of those. And, and what I do is just learn, learn from it and don't make the same mistake twice. Um, and uh, uh, and and I had a, we have had a few field um issues that I now I cannot pinpoint one. So I I'm, apologize. I'm, I'm going to have to skip that answer. But we had a few shenanigans happening in the field. Oh, wait a minute. This happened the other day. Um, we were on the boat and we almost got fire. Oh. That was very scary. That was very scary. So it was just a mistake. Uh, we were not paying attention to the stack up of equipment on the boat. And we put equipment on top of, of, a, of, a, of two conductors and a battery and and uh, and a charger. And the, the, the cables were not properly shielded. And apparently that caused a little fire. And wow. um, it was getting cold, so we were getting distracted by what we were doing. We're not paying attention. All of a sudden, we see smoke uh, off the back of the boat, and oh, uh, it, was, it was a scary moment. But we over, overcame it. So yes. that was uh, that was as close as a little epic, uh, as an epic fail as I, I could think of right now. <laughs> well, you had mentioned before about um, one of your sensors. Um, d did you lose it at some point, and you had to go oh, retrieve it? Is it, that something it's that can be considered a fail? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you, Melissa, for, for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> so we were doing, yeah, that was, we were doing a test, uh, um, actually, and we were not really supposed to be doing that test because we didn't ask the Navy for permission at the time. But later we, we found out that it would have been okay. But we took a system out and we just wanted to go to the dock and just throw in the water and do some things with it. Uh, and uh, there was a, a piece of equipment I was not supposed to lose and, and I just fell off the dock and uh, ended up at 40 feet of water. Not a big oh, deal geez, because, yeah. as you recall, I'm a, I'm a recreational diver, so I went back home got my diving gear and uh, went right uh, after it. And, uh, you know, the guys that were with me, are you supposed to be doing this? I was like, probably not, oh. but I'm going to go get it anyway. I'm yeah. pretty confident in my diving abilities. So, Sounds like an excuse just to dive. <laughs> it, nice it, was a very, it, it was a good day out and, uh, you know, absolutely, Melissa. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's a comment here from Hilltop that says, what is the most important thing you have had to engineer? Wow. Well, Right now, actually, I, I'm going to uh, go back to the recent work I'm doing uh, um, because I'm working on now because I think it's going to be very influential. It's going to be very important. So we're developing the next generation uh, underwater vehicle that's going to be completely autonomous. It's going to autonomous means that the system is going to work on its own and make decisions on its own. And we're far from having a military or a weapon system that can make those kind of decisions. But we're the early stage of doing that. And uh, um, I joined a team that, that really out of the box, box thinkers um, that are really uh, putting their best effort, putting the system together. And my contribution towards the team has been integrating on uh, the sensor system for that vehicle and also developing the uh, sensors that we're going to use for navigation and underwater. Um, and that, that's been after probably uh, 12, 15 years in, in, in my career, that was the first time that I got to put it all together. And, um, and, and say, okay, now I'm going to do something of my own. But it took time and experience to get to the point where now you can call your system your own. And then although the system is more complex than just my piece, um, putting the sensor system together for this autonomous underwater vehicle that's going to um, um, uh, make decisions on its, on its own and perform its mission on its own is, is I think, by far so far, the, the most important uh, um, sensor system I've put together so far. Oh, wow. Um Another question from Hilltop, it's kind of a follow-up. What inspires your designs? Um, well, um, cost, uh, simplicity, and performance. So I always think about the simplest way to 
to approach a problem. And in my line of work, I don't necessarily come up with the designs, but sometimes I get to frame the problem in a way that can be, and come up with a concept with, with a high level, top level design. And then the this indiv individual engineering disciplines take from there and go ahead and design the thesis. But really cost has to be at the top of the list, always thinking of the best way to do something, uh, uh, you know, minimizing part count, minimizing complexity. Um, because down the road, if you have a very complex system that's hard to build, it's going to drive cost and it's going to be impossible to maintain. And uh, eventually the customer might no longer want it. Um, um, so definitely that has to be on the top of the list. Very nice. Um, uh, from Graham McDaniel, where do you base your operations? So we're currently based in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Um, start this tiny state um, and I in the, in the union I live in the smallest town in the tiniest state so um, in a little town called Warren um, and, and uh, I live about 20 minutes from from my work site and uh, we're but we're based out of Portsmouth um, that's where our center is called the Sea Power Capability Center and is um, it's actually a small part of the big Raytheon company business which is primarily a Massachusetts company mm -hmm. we have a lot of presence um, um, in Arizona with Raytheon Missile Systems. It's also, also in the uh, West Coast, in California. Um, but our, we're part of our, our, our branch of the company is based out of Portsmouth, uh, Rhode Island. So you're right by the ocean too. That right by the ocean. Yeah. And most importantly, we're really close to our Navy customers. So we're really uh, door to door to the uh, Naval Undersea Warfare Center uh, that services the uh, Navy base here in, in, um, in Newport, Rhode Island. And having um, the company establishing themselves uh, in the, right there with the customer is very important. That way we can keep uh, the dialogue and the relationship growing. Nice. Very nice. We've got a question here from Micah and Andre. Um, how exactly do you use undersea sensors to help soldiers at sea? Do you send them information? And if so, what type of information? And then Andre asks a little follow-up question. Have you ever aided in a war or have your sensors been used before? Okay, so um, the, the I have not been in a war situation. Good. Um, there are people that are professionals that they know what they're doing, and they are they they are. I'm not, I'm not that kind of guy. Uh, you don't want me to be out there. But uh, yes, the transfers. Yes, we have uh, developed sensors that are actually currently being used. And I cannot say that I developed the sensors, but I was part of the team that developed the sensor. For example, the Sunwolf class destroyer, um, the DDX. A next generation uh, um, um, destroyer ship houses an uh, acoustic array, and I think most of you have a picture of that a boat. If you uh, if you can go to that and show it, um, this one, right? The, the, there, there you go. So below the water line, below the water line, there is a big acoustic array, a mid frequency array that's used to detect uh, enemy submarines, and there is a, a high frequency sensor that's used to detect and avoid mines and uh, it's called in strike mine avoidance and how does the, do those sensors protect the sailor uh the soldier in this case to answer the question um in route the enemy can lay out mines um to cause a lot of damage to surface ships surface ships typically don't have the ability to detect where those mines are this is the first ship that combines the um uh, both anti-submarine meaning ability to detect and track submarines and also the ability to detect objects at very far ranges so you can avoid them as you move along so um, the data that we produce is essentially acoustic data echoes off those targets that tell the sailor hey do you have a mine like object here turn the ship left and avoid it um, so that's how our sensors and particularly for this ship uh, help the soldier and stay safe in the field. And in the future, we expect to be deploying um, uh, little autonomous vehicles to go ahead and search those mines and destroy them so they can, we can clear the way and keep the ocean safe. Okay, so um, these ships that you're talking about, um, are, they're out there right now doing their job, right? That, actually, this one was just recently commissioned. The okay. first one is out. I think the second one is on, on its way. So they're just being, they, they're just fielded. The sailors are using it. They assign some captains to it. And once they get everything running, they'll become, uh, they, they'll join, they're, they're going to be part of the fleet and they're going to start getting service and they're going nice. to start getting used. Very cool. So here's a question from Mrs. DeMaio, second grade. Uh, have you ever had to travel on a ship or submarine when testing out equipment? Yes, I have, and actually, uh, one of my one of my more memorable experiences, I had to 
um, spend time on the, there you go. That's a nice picture of, uh, I don't know if it's a nice picture, but it's a picture <laughs> of me on the USS, Mc, on the uh, 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 John McCain. Um, and uh, that boat, that ship had a sonar system, which was the precursor to the system we put in the Sumo class destroyer. So why am I doing there? They send me and, a, uh, and another engineer to learn about their system and how they use it and, uh, and bring back requirements so we could uh, integrate it into this new class of ship that we were developing at the time. So, um, uh, so yes, I have been able uh, to join uh, uh, a sea test and uh, also being on board of ships and, and learn how the sailors live and let me tell you, um, it's, it's awesome, the work they do. Uh, I was there for 10 days in confined uh, quarters. And uh, the first day that I got there was really exciting. And the next nine days, I was like, okay, when I'm getting off this ship. And the sailors do this in and out at yeah. months at a time. So a lot of my hat is off to them and a lot of respect to, to, uh, to our men or human in uniform that, that get, you know, live in these conditions just so we can keep safe. It's a big job. Um, so job. question here uh, from Navea and Mike. What is the farthest you have traveled for your job? And what are some of the places you've been because of your job? Yeah, so this particular picture and this particular test was in Japan. That was oh. the farthest I've ever traveled, actually. That was kind of a sweet deal. I got, to, I got to travel business class for free. That was pretty good. It was, uh, well, for free, you know, I didn't have to pay for it. Uh, but it very, it's a way to travel, but uh, it was justified because the, the continuous, it was such a long flight. It took me about uh, probably, uh, you know, most flights, it took me about 20 hours to get there. Um, and uh, we went from um, Okinawa to, uh, uh, to, to Tokyo and then back. I didn't spend a lot of time in Tokyo, unfortunately. I love that city and I wish I could go back again and, uh, and, try and explore it a little bit more. Nice. Um, ben from JCD STEM asks, what STEM subjects do you use in your job? Oh, uh, by nature, all the letters in that acronym. All you of know, them. The science, uh, the technology, uh, the engineering, the mathematics. Um, it's, uh, it's funny. I've, many engineers that I know have told me that, you know, hey, you know I took, <clears throat> everybody has to take calculus, for example, advanced mathematics and things of that sort. But some, some people don't get to use it. I'm like, really? Come on. You know, I, it's, it's in my line of work, it's, uh, we, we, we uh, go back to those concepts uh, very frequently. Um, mm -hmm. and as I mentioned before, I think I did, I, I really joined engineering as a science major. I majored in science and I became more interested in the technology of some of the instruments that we use. And I, I was, then I joined Raytheon as a, as a scientist essentially, but they, they turned, I, I got my interest into engineering and learning systems engineering, how to engineer a system, how to put a system together, particularly for applications, uh, military applications. So uh, um, so all, all three, all four letters. And uh, if I could add A over there, art is also part of engineering. You, there, you have to, sometimes um, art can go, go a long way, uh, simplify a concept, be able to communicate it uh, to, to somebody else. It requires not only technical skills, but a little bit of artistic ability as well. So uh, uh, if you're an artist, don't think that you cannot make it into a science or technical field. There you go. Now, is there any, any one of those part of that acronym that, you know, when you go into work and you're like, yes, it's a math day. Like, is there any, any one that's your absolute favorite out of those? You know, uh, uh, I like the T more than the, the others because the technology. I'm, I to, the technology part, just because I'm, uh, um, I, um, uh, I'm a, I, I do to, I, I like to, uh, 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 work with my hands and do things in practice and, and, uh, I get my hands dirty, so to speak. So I get to learn better when I'm playing with something and I actually get into breaking things. Like, oh, that's, that's why you shouldn't do this or that. Um, but I enjoy uh, the, the end part too, the mathematics part too. I do a, a lot of analysis uh, of data and sometimes handling all that data and combining it into graphs and, and, uh, and, and making plots such that management can understand a very complex idea is a very fundamental thing that is a very important skill to have. So, um, but, but I like the way you put it, Melissa, um, of, uh, oh yeah, today's going to be an M day or a science day. And, and sometimes <laughs> it's between T and M and there's a little bit of uh, all the other things between. But, nice. Uh, nice. Yeah. Um, so a comment from Nora and Emily, is your work hard and what parts are hard and what are some of the hard parts about being an ocean systems engineer? Okay. So yeah, the work can be hard at times and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, interestingly enough, the hardest part of the job. Sometimes it's not really the problem in front of you. 
it's the people you have to work with. Uh, so because nothing can happen uh, if you're not part of a team. And that's exactly that's a good thing. So sometimes you have to overcome conflicts in personality and communication skills and communication uh, styles to get ideas across. And that can be a very hard part of your job, not necessarily mm -hmm. the problem at hand. Once you get the people part figured out, everything else feels to me feels like a hobby because I'm doing what I what I like. Um, but de dealing sometimes with uh, with the part where you have to uh, you know negotiate and 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 talk about I ideas, particularly with team members that you may or not agree with all the time, is very challenging. It's very very hard. Nice. Um, four questions, all kind of asking the same thing from Nick, Megan, Nason, Bridget, and. Um, there are, what is your favorite part of what you do? The most exciting part, your favorite thing to do being an ocean engineer and what is fun about your job? Wow. So um, you're going to have to remind me those four parts again. Okay. So I'll start with the last one. Fav the, okay. The fun, fun part about my, yeah, the fun part about my job is to every now and then I get to get out of the office and play with a cool toy that hasn't been used before. Uh, or it's, it's like the, the, the precursor of something that you know is going to be big at some point. That's, that's very fun. And working with talented people and uh, um, get a day out in the office and, and, and move your lab essentially to a boat and spend your day on the water um, can, is, is certainly a very rewarding and fun day, mm -hmm. uh, part of, uh, of the line of work that I do. <clears throat> now, so, uh, the most... Um, your favorite thing about being an engine, ocean systems engineer? Well, it's staying at my favorite thing about being an ocean uh, um, engineer or undersea technologist, as I call myself sometimes, is to really stay at, at, uh, at the forefront of things to come. Um, so in my line of work, we're really working sometimes with old technology, but we're shaping what the new the future technology is going to take us based on the available technology now i know it sounds confusing but it's a it's an iterative process recursive process where we see where the industry uh, commercial industry is going and then we come up with new designs based on what we see and then the commercial side looks at what we're doing and, and then starts developing technology to accommodate that so it's, it's a loop that goes both ways and uh that's that's very enjoyable you know it's very fun for for me to work and that was motivation but also I have an interest in the ocean environment. Um, I, I was a, a major in physics. I was trained in marine science and technology and oceanography. So I always wanted to stay uh, in that environment um, um, and work with technology that's going to be used on, in the undersea environment at some point. So that, that's, that's a fun part of my job. Nice. Um, Connor Stelling asks, do you have a favorite thing that you have built? Favorite thing that I've built? Um, actually, yes. Um, I... <laughs> I did build this data acquisition system. What does that mean is, it's a, just a digital system that connects to sensors and collects data and records data. And I didn't have a lot of money money for it. I got very limited funds. So I, I had two choices. I well, do I get an electrical engineer to help me out here? Or should I try to figure this out on my own and do it, you know, do it like a little house project kind of thing. So I did it on my own and actually worked out beautifully. So even though it was a little effort, I lit it, I did it with a low budget and I got the pride that I put it together by myself end to end. Yeah. Sounds like a trivial task, but uh, sometimes uh, when you want to design a system to, uh, you know, uh, um, with high reliability and, and, and for a customer, you typically, you know, do the full design very in a busy, very di di disciplined fashion. Uh, but sometimes I get to take shortcuts and do things for a short term project that I know are not going to be used later. So I have a lot of liberty and freedom in terms of, of how I implement a, a system and build it together. So, yeah, that little data acquisition system uh, was one of my favorite creations. Nice, a little DIY, doesn't hurt yeah. anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, now we're gonna switch gears a little bit, talk about how you kind of got to where you are now. And we've got a question um, that, what was, what was your childhood like? So as a kid, um, you know, I didn't develop any particular interest in uh, anything on, uh, until I got to high school. Um, I, you know, at some point I remember I wanted to be a marine biologist and that happened after I went to a trip in SeaWorld. And I think most kids feel that way the first time they see a show or they see all these giant uh, um, life forms, right? Um, um, but, and then at one point in my life, I wanted to be 
a, uh, a, a stunt person. That's because a uh, movie, you know, to appear in movies and to do stunts. And that's because I was in martial arts when I was growing up and I was pretty good in high school. And I wanted to do so, those kind of stunts that they do in movies and stuff. And then I participated in a science fair. And that, that changed the world for me because it's uh, all of a sudden I did, I, I did, I was dragging my feet. I didn't really want to do it. But this particular teacher, this particular school forced you to do it. And uh, so, so please listen to your teachers please do <laughs> um and then they made me do science fair and then i um i, I worked on a project and actually i enjoyed it and uh turns out and i won that year i won that you know i won first prize and we go oh, okay cool then i'll tour this year so after um i think in high school um the the science fair really shaped uh um my uh my decision to go into stem and into science and technology and, and eventually engineering um so um, my childhood, uh, you know, from, from a career standpoint, I'm answering the question from that standpoint, went from not necessarily knowing what I wanted to do, and I think most kids don't know what they want to do, to, hey, I want to I wanna do this, uh, you know, because I, I, w I, I happened to discover that I had a, a bit of an interest, uh, uh, if not a talent, for uh, uh, running experiments and, and doing science-related work. Nice. It never hurts to uh, win the science fair either. <laughs> no, that's a good, a good motivation, a good validation yes. that, hey, you did something right, even though yeah. you didn't feel that you were confident enough. And uh, that it helps with the confidence. Yes. Um, so Rohan from JCD STEM asks, in school, what was your favorite subject and why? Well, I was really, I was uh, pre-calculus, actually, calculus, mathematics. I like math. Um, because it, it felt like a game. It felt like a like a game. You know, you it's just uh, um, and, and although some problems seem challenging, it, you know, once I figured it out, it, it became kind of like a self rewarding exercise where um, I could find a solution at the end of the problem and compare it to the answer in the back of the book and say, yeah, I got it right. Versus uh, it was hard for me to study for social sciences, for example, or history. Um, it was, I found those subjects very challenging. I could never get it right. I was so, so in those disciplines. Um, but si yeah, and then si because of math, science came after that. So science became the natural application of math. Um, uh, so those were my, my favorite subjects. And I remember maybe in high school, uh, I think it was probably um, sophomore year or maybe junior year, I took a programming class in a language uh, that probably is obsolete by now. It's called, it's called BASIC in an Apple II computer. Um, now kids are learning all kind of good school stuff out there, but uh, programming actually was kind of cool too. Um, nice. I, uh, you know, I did not become a programmer. I program every now and then to get myself out of trouble, um, but it was a good, uh, good uh, skill to have, a good tool to, to have. Cool. And then just a follow-up question from the fourth grade crew at Franklin Square, New York. What were some of the most important things you learned in elementary school that help you with your job now? Oh, wow. Um, probably... <laughs> social skills and team and team uh, team building i think i did more of that in elementary school uh, you know just getting along with others and trying to solve uh issues as as a group than i did in high school i think so if i had to draw back from from my elementary school years uh, working together and uh in, in little projects or tasks or in playtime, i think that that uh is, is a skill that i i look uh, you know i built upon uh, later on teamwork good advice yep. Um, this is a question that I was going to ask, so I'm glad Brogan McCormick asked it. Um, from Trip Middle School, the question is, what was the project you won your high school science fair with? I built a solar house. Oh, uh, wow. Which, uh, as, which at the time, it didn't, well, maybe now it doesn't seem like a big deal, but back then, we were just flirting with the idea of having solar panels on homes. It was not a, it's not commonplace. I mean, this was in 1990. So, uh, um, um, probably many of, uh, yeah, I'm sure that many of you out there were not even born yet. And, uh, but it was an idea that was been uh, um, tossed around of having, uh, you in the future, having houses with solar panels. So I, you know, I, I built my own solar, uh, I mean, my own um, model home. And then I, I bought some solar uh, cells and I, I soldered them together and made a little panel uh, by myself and then uh, plug it into some recharge, uh, rechargeable batteries and put a little switch and a little, uh, some LEDs or light emitting diode uh, lights inside uh, the house and then just uh, um, charge it outside, turn it on all night, um, show that, uh, that it could work. And um, it, it was that, that was, that was it. That was the first, pro that was the, uh, the first project. And uh, it was very, I, in retrospect, I think it was very well made. And actually I look at some of the plots that I, I did at the time, not knowing any better. And I see like, I was, you know, it was, 
I really got into it, and that it's uh, um, it was very rewarding. Particularly walk out with first place, that was great. Right. Where did you come up with that idea? Was that something that you were interested in, or did the idea come from a no, teacher? No. Well, I, I, a friend of my dad, I remember, he was in the business of selling solar panels for boats, and uh, they used they, at that time. They were very expensive, and uh, and uh, you know, it's 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 not the first time I think somebody uh, had come up with a project of a solar house. I mean, it, it's been done many times before and now it's probably obsolete and people don't do it anymore in science fairs. Uh, but uh, that, I figured, well, well, I just want to work the project. And, uh, you know, my dad encouraged me and he's a technician. So he helped me out, uh, you know, with, a, um, with, the, with the electrical connections and, and, and drawing the schematics for it. And uh, it became like a good uh, afternoon project. Every time I come from, from school, instead of going out, wasting time and playing, you know, doing something that's not value, I was engaged in this. I was building it, every, you know, an hour, an hour a day you know, on the weekends. That became a little, you know, project of mine. And, um, and uh, you know, I put the solar panels outside and, and measure voltage at the output at uh, different times, times of the day. So that was, that was pretty cool. Nice. Um, we have another question about the science fair. Do you feel like if you didn't go to the science fair that you would have gotten a different job? Do you feel like your, your path might have been different if you didn't do the science fair? Probably, probably. Oh. Um, I think so because uh, it, it just got me working in, in, that, um, um, in, that, uh, in that area. I was, I was inclined towards more creative fields, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, and uh, particularly, I, would, I think I consider myself somebody with high artistic ability, but I, I tend to be on the creative side of it, um, but I didn't pursue that more and probably because I found this interest in, in science and mathematics through science fair. So I, I, that's a very good question. I, I think not, um, but you know, you never there know. There you go. Very important. That, that's, your, that's your pivotal moment was that science fair. Listen up, kids. It was. Science it fairs was. are cool. Yeah. <laughs> And they might inspire you. We've got a question here from um, Megan, Kara, and Cadence. What was your first job? So my first job, I was um, – actually, my very first job, I was a part-time instructor of uh, Taekwondo. I was from a very young age. I was 15 or 16, and that was my very first paid job, actually. I, uh, I was volunteering in the school and I, I kind of wanted um, to earn money and say, hey, dude, you know, I've been helping you out here. Uh, um, you know, uh, I can, you know, can I get a, a, some kind of salary? And then he offered me three, three fifty an hour, three dollars and fifty wow. cents an hour to teach a Saturday program mm -hmm. that we put together. And that was my very first paid job. And uh, in college, my very first uh, paid job, other than uh, working in the labs as, a, as an undergrad, um, I was a, a physics instruct, uh, instructor aide for mm -hmm. high school kids um, that were in the um, um, upper bound trio program. I'm not sure if, if uh, the audience knows out there what program is that, but um, uh, it, it, it got me exposed to a little bit of uh, uh, helping others with learning uh, physics and mathematics. And um, uh, so I kind of stayed in that after the Taekwondo gig, which didn't go too far, um, um, staying and, in, in, you know, hel helping others with the subjects of math and physics uh, helped me out stay in that, in that path. Yeah. Now, uh, if you would have gotten first place in that Taekwondo competition. Maybe. Might be I, I a different have, story, but will, it was a science fair. <laughs> I, I will have been in MMA or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. You know? <laughs> We've got a uh, comment from Johnny. Um, what was your dream job, or is this your dream job? I, I don't know. I think my dream job would have been to become a MythBuster, um, because when I remember the first time that I saw that show in Discovery Channel, I went like, "Why didn't I think of that? Work in special effects, and then have you know be so good at it that they you know they let you have a show with that would that would have been my dream job of uh, building things, um, breaking them up just to prove." Um, you know, hypothesis or prove a uh, myth out. I, I really like that show. I really love that show when it was on. And I still watch the reruns any now and then. It feels very engineering too. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah. Right I, would, yeah I will gravitate it towards that anyway. That's very cool. Um, we've got a question from uh, JCD Sem, Colin, and another one, Addison. Uh, what background do you need to become an ocean systems engineer? Um, talk a little bit about college. Uh, what do you need to do in college and the courses that you need to take? What was, what very, was your path? 
Very good question. I'll, I'll talk about my path, and it's not the same. It doesn't. It doesn't need to be that way for people looking into that career, because nowadays there are programs that focus on the undersea technology and marine technology. Actually, there are programs that focus on systems engineering, which is a subdiscipline of engineering on its own right now. But uh, my path, I entered the system engineering field um, uh, as a as an analyst. Um, coming from a physics, from an applied physics background, my undergrad was in theoretical physics, and I wanted to incline towards a more applied side. So when I was uh, about to make a decision to go to grad school, um, I, I, I went to um, uh, physical oceanography because I one I like the ocean, and number two it gave me an opportunity to apply uh, the theoretical physics uh, work that I've done as an undergrad, right? And uh, so. And after that, I graduated. I got an, uh, an offer, a uh, job offer here. After I graduated, finished my master's, and uh, um, and they allowed and they entered me, hired me as a systems engineer. And at the time, I didn't even know what that was. Um, and it turns out that Raytheon and many other companies too hire systems engineering from a very wide variety of fields, from science, mathematics, and also engineering. And the reason they do that is because at the system level, you need to have a, a more breadth of skill than depth. You need to be less specialist and more broad. And typically, science background, mathematicians, uh, physicists tend to think more about uh, um, uh, big picture problems and, uh, and are more interested in the, in the solutions to those big, those big problems. And they tend to make very good systems engineers. Um, and uh, so... That was my path. Uh, actually, uh, after five years in the job, I, I always wanted to finish my doctorate, my PhD degree. Um, and it's something that I always wanted to do. But at the time, I, I just needed to enter the workforce and start earning um, because, uh, um, because it's an important thing to do. <laughs> but uh, I, I always left, felt that I didn't fully completed my academic journey without finishing that doctorate degree. So after I started working the company, I asked for the company um, uh, for sponsorship and they, uh, they allow me to go back to work. I mean, to go back to school to finish an ag graduate degree. So I ended up finishing a, a doctorate degree in marine uh, technology um, where I focus on underwater acoustics and um, underwater observation techniques. And then I came back to work doing uh, um, a little bit more of the same thing that I was doing before I left. To, for the, the, by the way, I didn't really leave uh, work. I, I worked uh, on my PhD while I was pursuing work full time. Extremely challenging. Don't recommend it. But it's just leaving proof that if I can do it, I, I think anybody else can. If you just yeah. put your mind to it and determine it. Yeah. So that was my path. But uh, if you want to get to a... Uh, to a career in underwater technology or underwater or ocean system engineering, for example, there are programs out there that uh, are uh, it's typically start with an undergraduate degree, a four-year degree in one of the engineering disciplines, and then you, you do a master's on a specialty, and uh, the, the specialty could be in ocean engineering or uh, underwater technology. There are programs out there that can allow you to do that. Nice, nice. Um, we've got a question here. What is some advice you could give middle schoolers if they want to do what you're doing today. And what are some tips that you would give people who want to have your job? So this is about advice. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, there are a lot of, I, um, there are a lot of kits out there, kits uh, to build little uh, robot, inexpensive robots that you can, you can use in, in the water environment. I think that's the future for undersea technology is uh, undersea robotics and uh, undersea vehicles. And if you want to um, uh, get into this line of work, I would just you know start playing with those things, and you might learn you might learn that um, you actually uh, uh, enjoy it. And there's a few competitions out there. The Marine Technology Society, a little plug for MTS out there, um, do host com uh, do host a, an annual competition of undersea robotics. They have instructions um, um, on how to build an underwater vehicle and then control it with a very inexpensive components. So if you want to get into that field and understand the type of problems that undersea technologists and all ocean systems engineers are, want to solve, that can be a good gateway. That could be a good, uh, introduction to, um, to the field. Very cool. Very, very hands-on too, which is fun. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're getting a little bit into your, um, stories that you told here. Uh, we've got a question. What Taekwondo school did you participate in? <laughs> this, this person says, I'm a first degree black belt. All right. What, at, what did you end up as? Uh, first degree black, uh, black belt as well. 
Oh, and nice. uh, I went to actually as a plug for the organization. I was part of the International Taekwondo Federation. Uh, oh. There's many different uh, type of uh, schools of thought. There's the World uh, Taekwondo Federation that does the Olympic style Taekwondo. I was in the International Taekwondo Federation, which is a different style. Um, but I made it all the way to black belt first degree. I was really proud of that. And uh, um, I always wanted to go back and, and go up the ranks. Uh, and then, uh, but um, 15 years later and 40 pounds later, it became harder to go back and do it. Um, and then when I tried to go back, I hurt my knee. I actually, um, um, I had to get surgery for get, getting my ACL repaired. So that was the, the world telling me, hey, dude, your Taekwondo days are over. Just do something else. Uh, but yeah, it was a first degree black belt. And uh, um, the hardest part of doing Taekwondo with a, a guy like me that wears uh, very heavy prescription glasses is that at the time I, when I sparred or when I participated in tournaments, I had to take my glasses off. So I had to get really close to my opponent to see what they were doing. That didn't quite work my way uh, all the time. Um, but had a lot of fun doing that, though. Good, 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 good. We've got a kind of a fun question here from Jose. What do you prefer? I'm assuming that's what this means. Pancakes or waffles? Oh, I pancakes. I'm a pancake guy. No. There you yeah. go. <laughs> whole, whole wheat is pre preferable. There you I, go. I do like whole wheat pancakes uh, and uh, with maple syrup, no substitutes. I you were into do... that very strongly. You must have some strong yeah. views about that. We've got another question here from uh, Zachary. Do you have a family and do you ever use your engineering powers to help your family? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, I do have a family. I uh, have two beautiful girls to age 20 and eight years old. Oh, wow. So a uh, very the different age uh, difference there. Um, the eight year, year actually to, in preparation for this broadcast, I consulted with my second grader and uh, she asked me a lot of questions that are all along the same lines of your question. And so I'm happy that we trained uh, last night up for, for this. Um, if uh, yes, I do have family. I have, uh, um, I'm married. I have a wife here in Rhode Island. I've been here for 17 years. And do I apply my engineering skills at home? Absolutely. Um, uh, so, and my wife, I have a bad reputation with her because she tells me, and I'm probably the same at work. Uh, she tells me every time I do something, I tend, the first time I do it, I, I screw it up, uh, or I break something. And then the second time I do it, then it comes out, right? It's not a far stretch from how I do things at work. The first time I do it, I tend to take too much risk and I usually have a little bit of an oops or, or a little fail like we were talking about before. And then the second time around, things come a lot better. So that's how I, I, I do it at, at home too. But that's the, uh, that's the perfect advice is learn from your mistakes, right? That's Absolutely, and keep moving mistakes. forward. There you go. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a question here that says, what movie does your life most relate to? Uh, I don't know if I uh, find uh, You know, I, in the questionnaire in preparation for this venue, uh, I, there was a similar question. And I think I answered Rocky, Superman, and there was a third one. Now I forget, obviously, because we're live and it's not coming <laughs> to me. But anyway, uh, because both Rocky and Superman deal with, and I'm talking about the Superman, the Christopher Reeve Superman, all right? The real, to me, that's a real no. Superman. Sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, the, because they deal with rising from the ashes and rising from, um, from, from adversity or from having all the odds against you and then just coming out victorious at the end. And uh, Rocky is one of my favorite movies for that uh, um, and uh, so I, I, it's not I my, identify myself with, uh, with those movies, but they speak to me a lot. Nice, nice. Um, well, I think we are all out of time here, Marcos. Um, one, um, uh, one question coming in. So what do you hope we as viewers learn from this live event? Oh, I, I really hope that you uh, do think um, if you consider ever consider science and technology that this will keep you on that path um, because you don't necessarily have to be uh, the top in the class or, or the, 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 you know, the, uh, or super smart guy to actually have a very productive and, and, and um, uh, career in science and, tech and technology, engineering, and mathematics um, that uh, uh, an average guy, actually, we need a lot of people more. Uh, we need a lot more, STEM um, um, students uh, to take on all the jobs that we expect to be uh, growing in this area in the, in the future. So don't, you know, because you may not be doing good in math right now, don't, don't let that deter you because uh, you might actually keep moving forward and, 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 uh, and find uh, uh, that it can be enjoyable if you learn in the right way or if you uh, apply your skills in, in, 
in the setting that allows you to discover those talents. So don't, don't give up on STEM, please. Uh, yeah. we, we need more people like you. We need you guys. Stick with it. Absolutely. Yeah, stick with it. Well, Marcos, thank you so much. That's all the time we have today, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Take care, guys. Pleasure. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, our next and last event of 2017, let me get this up here, is Ali Sedeno. Ali is a... Um, she is a ship navigator for an offshore drilling company. She literally drives a giant ship. It's very cool. I'm sure there's lots of uh, science, math, technology, and engineering involved in that. So um, until then, for Jason Learning, I'm Melissa, and we'll see you next time on Jason Live.